Hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest and greatest episode of the conversation with the Hawaii Cyber Lions Club. My name is Chris Lum Lee. I am joined today by uh, Lion Lo Merhoff and um, director on our Hawaii Cyber Lions Foundation and good friend of the club, Peggy Oyama. Today, we are talking with Brent Mertz, who is with the Lions I Bank of Hawaii. So, um, Brent, thanks for joining us. Um, I'll turn it over to you now. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I am thrilled to be here. I love to talk about the iBank uh, and I love to engage with all the Lions who help uh, support all the work we do. So I guess, Brent, you know, first question I had, um, can you kind of give us a little bit of a background about, about the iBank, um, kind of how it came to be, um, who you're serving, that type of thing? Sure, sure thing. Um, so I like to say that we are the uh, hub for I donation in the islands. Um, we act both um, as a recovery service and also as a distribution service for all of the eye tissue that comes to the ophthalmic community of the islands. Um, so that means either when an eye donor who is registered passes away or when somebody passes away and their next of kin, their loved ones make the decision to donate their eyes. Um, we are the ones who dispatch a trained recovery technician to recover that tissue. Um, we bring it back to our laboratory here at the eye bank. We keep it safe. We test it for uh, health and viability. And then we distribute it to surgeons all around the islands and also on the mainland sometimes if we can't find surgeons here. Um, and it goes on to provide a vision saving transplant for somebody who really needs it. Um, so we serve uh, anybody who needs a sight saving transplant. And at large, we try to serve the community as best we can. Um, we like to think that we provide a really, really valuable service to the ophthalmic community. Um, and we're a really key piece of the medical infrastructure here. Um, there's no other eye banks in the islands doing what we do. So we like to think that we really are the, the, the local provider for this kind of service um, here, here in our state. Um, so to to don't to donate um, the the corneas, do you have to? Does it require you to be the um, organ donor is on the back of your driver's license, or is that a separate type of donor listing? Well, that's right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So that that box that you tick um, extends to all organs and tissues that could possibly be donated after you pass away. Um, corneas, um, which is the clear front part of the eye, um, corneas, uh, sclera, which is the white part of the eye, those are both considered um, donated tissues and that's all covered by that um, very, very, very generous donation uh, decision to donate. Yeah. So um, I guess how, how is the, the demand for What's the demand like for, um, for corneas? Sure. Um, so we are fortunate in this country that there is no wait list for cornea transplantations. Um, if you think about uh, cornea, it's kind of a, a easier tissue to transport and to store than say something like a heart. Um, so the shelf life, if you can call it that, is about two weeks for a cornea, which means it's very usually um, pretty easy in terms of logistics to line up donors. So thankfully there is not a tremendous uh, backlog of, of uh, cornea recipients who are waiting in this country. That's not true all around the world. Um, obviously, other countries with uh, less robust medical infrastructure usually have, have uh, patients who wait a lot longer. Um, but I will say the demand is, is, is steady just because um, there are a lot of corneas doesn't mean there isn't a huge need. Um, it is a really, really common transplant. Um, I believe one of the most common transplant procedures that people receive uh, is a cornea transplant to save their vision. Um, and that can be from a number of causes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, some, it's something that's really common. Um, it's really safe. It's a really, really low um, graft rejection and failure rate. Again, because the cornea is, is simpler compared to something like a lung or a heart um, where a lot more can go wrong. So people get cornea transplants all the time. Um, they get them really frequently, um, especially older people. And um, all around the islands, yeah, like I said, we like to think that we are, are, are really um, helping in terms of access. Um, we're helping people in Hawaii get the transplants that they need because if you think about even though corneas last a while um getting them from the mainland obviously is less than ideal because that transport time does make a difference to the health of the tissue in a lot of cases so the fact that we have a place where you know community a community center where corneas are donated from the community and then repurposed to people um in hawaii who need the transplants i think makes a big difference and we like to think that it does some thunder so, going on in the background. Speak, speaking of 
the speed of which you sure. need to transport them. Can you give us an idea from the time that you're maybe given a phone call that they're available, what ha transpires from point A to Z? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, I, I, I will start, unfortunately, at the point of death. Um, that is kind of when we kick into action, but it starts even before that. It starts, you know, whenever you have that conversation with your loved one about um, eye and tissue donation, that is really like the beginning of the process. Um, and I think it's something that somebody that everybody should should um, consider with their loved ones because obviously it's really, really important um, to get those tissues donated. Um, but yeah, so let's say, so point of death, um, the hospital notifies uh, the eye bank that somebody who pa has passed away who is a registered organ donor. Um, and after that point, we dispatch a technician to go recover the tissue. Um, sometimes if a donor or if a, a decedent looks like they could become a donor, um, then the hospital will offer the case to us and we have staff who will get in touch with the next of kin and they will perform uh, what we call a donor risk assessment interview with the next of kin. So that basically just goes through a brief summary of the medical history with their next of kin to make sure that there are no uh, things that might rule out uh, viability for donation. And that can be a number of things. Um, it's usually not the things you think. So you can be blind and still donate your corneas. There are a lot of different kinds of blindness and they don't all involve the corneas. Um, but normally it's for things like um, communicable viruses that might be in the blood um, that could potentially be transmitted um, through the cornea to the recipient. Um, so either it's, uh, in, in our case, actually, we do the interview in all, in all cases just because it's an extra safety check. Um, but from the moment that you, that you take that box that you become an organ donor, the process basically becomes automatic after your death, um, that the notice of death reaches us. And then, like I said, we dispatch the technician. Um, and the te technician usually does uh, the recovery, which is a surgical extraction of the cornea that's usually done in the hospital. Um, and then they bring the cornea back here and it stays at the lab. Uh, it has to go through, like I said, a couple of screening processes. So we look at the cornea under a microscope to make sure it looks healthy. Uh, that usually takes a couple of days. And then we try to get it under, I would say two or three days because like I said, the turnaround is really important. Um, so it, it lives here for a couple of days um, in the specialized uh, storage media that we have here. And then it, it, uh, it, we, we offer it to a surgeon. Uh, who requests a tissue. Usually there's some kind of specification that the surgeon has. So we try to match it. We try to match the best possible tissue for what the procedure is. Um, and then if the surgeon likes what the tissue is that we have on offer, then we send it out to them. And like I said, hopefully that process gets wrapped up, wrapped up under, under five or six days. But corneas are good. Uh, generally the line is for 14 days in what we call intermediate storage, but they can also be preserved for longer um, in a different kind of storage that can keep them viable for certain surgeries up to a year. Um, but we try to we try to have maximum turnaround because, like I said, um, we we are really where surgeons come uh, when they need local tissue. Um, so we try to keep them as happy as quickly as possible. Thank you. So Brent, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, you're a little quiet, but I can hear you. Okay. So what kind of injuries or situations um, need a cornea transplant? Sure. Um, so the most common is called um, uh, keratoconus. That's when your cornea kind of, and again, the cornea is just the front part, the clear front part at the, uh, the front of the eye. Um, and that's kind of when your cornea, for one reason or another, kind of becomes misshapen. And rather than being a little dome, it becomes like kind of a steeper, uh, more, of a, more of a cone shape. Um, and that can be very painful and it can impair your vision because what the cornea does is it reflects, refracts the light that enters the eye. So if you can imagine if your cornea is the wrong shape, then the, li the light uh, refracts at the wrong angle and it can really distort or blur your vision. Um, so one of the most successful treatments for that um, is a cornea transplant because uh, rather than trying to surgically repair a cornea in that state, a lot of times it's easier just to replace it with a healthy donor cornea. Um, that's just one of the examples. So people sometimes also confuse uh, cornea procedures with things like uh, cataracts. Cataracts do not affect the cornea. Cataracts are, uh, they involve the lens of the eye, which is further behind the cornea um, in terms of anatomy. Um, so even people with glaucoma, for example, can become organ donors generally. Um, even if you've had cataract surgery, it doesn't preclude you from being a donor, but that is a, a different kind of procedure. So you wouldn't get a, 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 a cornea transplant for cataract surgery, but you would get it for something that affects, again, that like, most anterior part um, of your eye. So, so Brent, I know, so you mentioned um, yes. during during the process, you talked about um, the assessment 
Um, does blood type play a role in 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 the the corneas, like yeah. like it would for say bone marrow or any uh, or certain types of um, organ transplants? Really interestingly, it does not. Um, the cornea is an avascular tissue. That means it doesn't have blood vessels going through it the way that a lot of other organs in the body do. Um, it's really a fascinating part of the body because um, if you, you can imagine if it had blood vessels, you wouldn't be able to see through it. Um, so it, the fact that it's totally clear means it's really, really kind of a unique tissue in the body. Um, so no, blood type does not play a role. Um, neither does tissue type, which is another thing that you have to worry about for organs, um, which makes the whole matching process a lot easier um, in terms of uh, providing tissue for donors because it's one less thing you have to worry about and it really reduces the risk of, of uh, complications. So Brent, if I were a member of the public and I wanted to yes. know a bit about the Lion's Eye Bank of Hawaii, can you tell me a bit about, you know, how long they've been around and generally kind of a, a brief history and where you're located yeah. and where would somebody go? Um, what can the public learn from you? Certainly, certainly. certainly. Yeah, um, I, I encourage the public to reach out to their, their local Lions clubs. Um, there is a lot of institutional knowledge about the iBank that precedes me. Um, I only started working here oh, about a year, year and a half ago at this point. Um, so there is a long history of the iBank that I am still uh, learning, um, but there are lines who have been affiliated with the iBank since the very, very beginning. Um, I will say we were a charter member of the iBank Association of America, which uh, came into being in 1961. Um, we were not in the exact same uh, form that we are now, so we had a different name, um, and it was a slightly different um, organization, but there is definitely like a through line from that original iBank that opened in 1961 to the modern Lions Eye Bank of Hawaii. So we have been doing this work for a long time um, with the support of the Lions from day one um, and really have, have kind of grown with the profession of eye banking. Um, because from early on, it was identified that there was a big need here um, because our medical infrastructure situation is so unique. Um, and we have basically been taking care of the ophthalmic community since around, at least since the early 60s. And uh, in terms of resources, yeah, sorry. <laughs> our website is lebh.org. Um, it's, it's a work in progress, but I encourage anybody who's interested to check it out. Um, and again, yeah, reach out to your local lines and they can hopefully answer your questions or put you in touch with resources. And you said that you've been with the iBank for over a year now. What kind of an experience or what did you have to learn to be able to do this job? Because I mean, sure. it sounds very scientific, what you're able to explain to me. Sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, I think it's, I don't want to say it's it's simple, but I, I constantly am grateful that I work with corneas, like I said, and not a more complicated part of the body. I think corneas are very simple and really fascinating and uh, not very hard to explain. But my background is in biomedical engineering, so I come from kind of the lab the lab side of things. Um, I, I worked on <clears throat> medical devices and things like that. Um, so the, the lab is very it comes very second nature to me. Um, I didn't have specifically any experience in eye banking when I came into this job, um, but I was really excited to kind of lend. My, my background to uh, what I consider like a really essential community service because that was something that I was very interested in. Thank you. Yeah. So, so on that note, what, um, can you tell us a little bit about your personal background and, and kind of how you um, found your way into this role? Cert certainly, yeah. Um, I'm originally from the East Coast. I'm from uh, Long Island, New York. I grew up there. Um, I went to school on the East Coast um, and I graduated relatively recently. I graduated in 2019. Um, and then I was working abroad for a little while. Um, I was working on a clinical infrastructure project in uh, Kenya, actually, and then I uh, was supposed to be there for a year and it ended up being forced back stateside because of uh, COVID closed the borders and this suspended my fellowship. Um, so I was kind of in in limbo for a little while. Um, and I was just looking for, for opportunities that, like I said, combined uh, my desire to be useful to a community with my expertise in, in uh, you know, biomedicine. And uh, I thought this would be a really good fit. And thankfully the Lions took a chance on me, even though, like I said, I was pretty new to eye banking. I'd always, I'd always kind of been uh, academically interested in it, but had never worked in an eye bank before. Um, but I, I love it. I, like I said, I, I started about a year ago and I've uh, we were closed a little bit for for a little period there for for the pandemic um, and so I was kind of brought on to help with the reopening um, and and the scale up from basically what was a really um, 
significant period of, of low coverage in terms of recovering tissue. Um, and I think we've been really successful in the last year to kind of expand our operations and reopen. Um, and I'm, I'm having a great time. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And also um, from the perspective for the lions, can you tell the uh, person who might be say a new lion, what the relationship is of the Lions Eye Bank of Hawaii and the Hawaii Lions Foundation, like how you interact with the Lions organization in Hawaii. And sure. if someone was a lion and wanted to volunteer, if there's any opportunities with you guys. Sure, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, Peggy, you can speak to that too because Peggy has volunteered in our office in the past. Um, but yeah, so so we, we accept um, volunteers of all kinds from the Lions. We, we are always, uh, looking for extra hands, whether it's organizational work around the office. Um, we have uh, an ongoing scanning project that we've been doing, basically digitizing old medical records um, that, that always requires um, ma manpower. Um, so yeah, little things like that. We always um, obviously encourage anybody who's interested to, to, to reach out. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, we, we, are, we are dependent on the Lions um, completely. We, we um, are an activity of the Hawaii Lions Foundation. So, so they um, provide us with our funding. Um, they, they oversee basically all of the administrative decisions um, that happen on like a higher level than, than the technical side of things, which is basically what I see, what I oversee. Um, so yeah, they, they, they operate the iBank. Um, they have kept the iBank running throughout all of its years of history. Um, and yeah, like we could not do what we do without the support of the Lions. Like I said, they are, they are a tremendous resource for us. Thank you. Yeah. So a uh, question just kind of on the, on the technical side of things, right? If, if there were somebody who um, would end up going into the, into the iBanking field, not necessarily on the administrative side, but um, anything on the technical side, I guess, what types of professions would you see or what type of disciplines would you see um, people that would go into that direction? Would they be um, nurses? Would they be med techs, med lab yeah. techs or... Any of the other? Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, nurses is a big one. Um, and also, um, yeah, med techs for sure. Um, anybody, yeah, who has like medical, um, medical training of any kind, really, anybody who has, especially anybody who's worked um, in settings that have brought them into contact with cadavers, we look for, um, because that can be difficult for a lot of people, completely understandably, but any kind of training that um, prepares you for that side of the medical profession is really, really useful. Um, so people like EMTs, um, we look for, for sure. Um, Anybody who has like a trauma background is, you know, prepared for basically anything, um, that that sort of thing. But yeah, any kind of medical training and really anybody who's kind of just interested in in eye banking, we 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 are willing to train people. I mean, uh, like I said, I, I was trained up basically from from zero in terms of all of the um, technical aspects of the recovery process. I had no, not never done that before. Um, so so anybody who kind of has a baseline uh, interest in in Bio, biomedicine, I think, is is suited for a role in eye banking. It's a really welcoming field. So, so do you get a lot of do you get a whole lot of people or anybody at all from any of the the programs, whether they be from any of KCC's programs or UH's programs, um, wanting to kind of spend some time to get some experience with you guys? We are actively recruiting from them. <laughs> um, we 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 are we are trying right now in terms of uh, in the course of our kind of. Uh, efforts to ramp up. We're trying to bring in more um, technicians, be they part-time or, or per diem, or maybe even full-time if we find somebody who's really interested. Um, but definitely, yeah. So yeah, UH, um, we're looking into recruiting from um, because I think it's, yeah, I think it's a really, it's a really great opportunity if you come and work for the, I think it's a great opportunity to get hands-on training um, and to get exposed basically to a lot of different aspects of this profession because we're a really small team. So you get to do a little bit of everything. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of a crash course, but in the best way, you know, we, we, we do a lot of really good work and it's, it's a, it's a complicated profession, but it's also really simple. Like I said, once you learn the workflow, it's, it's rewarding and fun. So do you work like 24 seven then if you have to go to collect the, um, the corneas and then get them out somewhere as well? That's the goal. Um, we don't have 24 seven coverage right now. I work pretty strictly uh, nine to five on normal work work days, so like Monday to Friday. Um, but 
if we have a surgery slated for the next week, for example, then we'll have somebody on call over the weekend. Um, and we're trying to bring on enough technicians basically that we can cover that 24 seven schedule because you really want to be able to have somebody who can answer their phone all hours of the day when that referral comes in. Um, because, you know, we take it very seriously when uh, the loved ones of a person who's passed away call us up and ask us to help, you know, honor that person. It's, it's a very, very significant um, contribution that we think we're able, we hope we're able to, able to make to the family. And so we want to be able to not miss out on any referrals just because um, we don't have enough people to cover different shifts. So we're working on basically covering around the clock. Um, we've had some, a good amount of success uh, in terms of expanding our coverage um, and also expanding our coverage across all the neighbor islands too. So right now our, our recoveries are active uh, pretty much ex pretty much exclusively on Oahu. We distribute to surgeons on all the islands, but in terms of recovering tissue, um, we just recover right now from Oahu, but we're working on finding per diems, finding other technicians um, who are on the neighbor islands. So that's something else that we're really trying to invest in right now is, is expanding our reach through across geography as well as, as, well as around, around the clock. Thank you. So because you guys are in Kuakini, um, mm. it's pretty easy if you need um, some work done over there and because you guys are right there, you guys can just take the, the corneas over. But what about the, what about specifically in neighbor islands? How much is there a delay between um, the cornea leaving your facility to gain to neighbor islands if, if it's needed there? Yeah, sure. Um, so our, our, <clears throat> our shipping procedures are very much uh, designed to keep corneas, you know, viable and safe throughout up to 24 hours in transit because we do occasionally provide corneas from the mainland and also receive them. So they have to certainly be able to make that trip. Um, and so compared to that, neighbor islands aren't a tremendous challenge. So a cornea needs to be refrigerated essentially. It needs to be between uh, two and eight degrees Celsius, which is basically a uh, standard refrigeration. Um, and it needs to be transported therefore in a box that can retain that temperature. So basically you just pack them in specialized coolers that have uh, like a, a chemical, basically a chemical ice pack that, that maintains that temperature. Um, and we just do regular basically quality assurance testing to make sure that the coolers that we are using for the transport can keep the corneas uh, safe and cold. Um, but yeah, in terms of that additional time, it's basically, it's basically the cost of doing business. I mean, it's, it's, it's better um, that it's coming from Oahu than it's coming from the mainland. So we consider it basically a net, a net positive that we're able to distribute from here at all. Um, and yeah, it does take maybe a couple extra hours, but it's not uh, dangerous to the cornea to be shipped for that for that duration. So there isn't so there isn't really a a dedicated storage space in for corneas up there. It's kind of everything um, is stored with you guys, and then you guys just send them out as requested. Is that Correct. Um, so certain hospitals, like hospitals that have same like dedicated um, same day surgery wings, will be able to maybe accept a cornea a day or two before and store it, um, and then pr provide it to the surgeon when the surgeon comes in to use uh, their operating theater for the transplant. Um, but yeah, normally we just house them here until we get requests to send them out. Um, this is kind of like I said, I think of it as like the hub. So uh, when when corneas need to be on the islands, even when they're sent from. Uh, I banks on the mainland. We get a lot of corneas from San Diego, for example, and they come here, um, and and they are stored here, and then they're uh, sent from here to their final point of destination. That's not always the case. Some surgeons will um, take corneas directly from other I banks all around the world, um, but generally, like I said, I think we we are kind of a landing a landing zone and a distribution zone for a lot of the tissue. So how? And I've kind of asked around this question, but yeah. as relates to this one specific point, um, how are you guys doing on, on storage space for the corneas? Like, I know, I know I asked about like the yeah. of them, but is it, you have corneas just full of your shelves full of corneas or you don't have enough or, you know, how's that capacity? Yeah, thankfully, I mean, <laughs> thankfully the corneas are really small. Um, they, they, they fit basically in what is essentially the, the, the the medical equivalent of a big refrigerator. Um, they they don't take up a, a tremendous amount of room. Um, mostly, what takes up the space is uh, like the associated uh, micros microscopes and things like that. So 
Um, we need microscopes to be able to look at the corneas to make sure they're healthy, and that takes up like counter space and stuff. But the corneas themselves are not really a tremendous like uh, space investment. Um, one of the things we're trying to get into is more sophisticated processing of the corneas. So there are certain pre-transplant processes that surgeons will request, um, and it's complicated, but basically there are certain preparations that you can do to make corneas more suited for different types of surgery. Um, and that takes technical staff, and that also takes uh, specific kinds of workspaces um, that we don't really have. So that's kind of what we're looking into right now in terms of um, expanding our premise this is, is making it more suited to do those kinds of uh, pre-transplant processing procedures. Um, but we're not in danger of like running out of room for corneas, for example, because like I said, they don't take up much room. Um, and we try not to hold too many at one time because we want to keep them moving. We don't like to think that they're ever in danger of expiring on our shelves because that's obviously what you would like to avoid. Um, I did mention that there's a way to preserve them for, for long term, um, and that can be done uh, to corneas, but that doesn't that doesn't take up any more room. Um, they just are basically in in small vials um, that can just be lined along along the shelves of the what is essentially a refrigerator that we have. Um, so yeah, so the corneas themselves very very small, don't take up much room at all. But there is like a lot of uh, overhead that is associated with all of the quality assurance steps that we do. That basically is most of our our, our floor spaces. So is the maximum shelf life for the corneas when you store them? Uh, two weeks is the industry standard. Um, a surgeon will probably not opt for a cornea that is 13 days old versus one that is like three or four days old. Um, they're both pretty much equally viable, but I, the ones that are, I think, closer to the date of recovery are generally considered more um, desirable. So that's why we try to keep them as on our shelves for as, as little time as possible. But the ones that are long-term preserved are good for up to a year. Um, and that's kind of a different animal. Those are used for different kinds of surgeries. And do you try to move some of your um, corneas that are getting closer to the, when you have to decide to put them into long-term storage or something like that, like that, do you move them to other states, other countries, or try to figure out some way to get them you. Yeah, so there, there, there is a, a basically a, a triage hierarchy where if we don't have, because there are only so many surgeons doing transplants here in the state. Um, so if we don't have any surgeries scheduled, then we'll offer to iBanks on the mainland. Um, and if there are no takers on the mainland, then we'll offer to iBanks internationally. Um, we, we try to make that process happen even before there is any danger of expiration. Um, but yes, definitely, like at the more days there are, elapsed since the date of recovery, since the date of death, um, the, the wider kind of our our uh, network of distribution distribution becomes up, to, up until the point of long-term preservation, which usually happens um, closer to the end of the shelf life. So that way we can extend it um, and make sure the cornea is still used for something, even if it isn't used um, in its first couple of weeks for, for an intermediate, uh, like for a, for a certain kind of procedure. Um, Brent, you earlier referred to um, helping ramp up the iBank again. Mm -hmm. um, so can you tell us how COVID-19 had any effects on either the iBank or your procedures? Sure. Um, so uh, as essential as cornea transplants are for saving vision, they are considered an elective procedure. So thankfully they can be more easily rescheduled than something like a heart transplant, which is, you know, imminently a matter of life and death. Um, so there were a lot of cornea transplants that were put off because of the pandemic as, you know, doctors kind of closed their practices and, and hospitals were being more restrictive about um, allowing their surgical suites to be used, things like that. Um, that definitely had an industry-wide impact on the volume of cornea transplants that were happening uh, domestically and also internationally. Um, so that kind of bottlenecked the amount of corneas that were being placed and therefore was reflected in the amount of corneas that were being recovered um, because you don't want to have a tremendous backlog, like I said, of corneas that can't be used. Um, and then in addition to that, there were medical standards that had to be changed um, because it was really unknown for a while whether COVID-19 could be transmitted by a cornea transplant. It seems like now that it can't, um, but obviously we do everything with the maximum amount of caution for our recipients so that there's no risk of any kind of cross-contamination. So uh, for a while, it was very, uh, you know, there, there was a period where the medical standards, like I said, had to be uh, updated to reflect 
basically an emerging understanding of a very new disease. Um, and that's done uh, by the IBINC Association of America, which is kind of our governing regulatory body along with the FDA. So um, once those guidelines came out, it was pretty much standardized, but um, you know, as there was in so many aspects of life, there was a little bit of uncertainty there for a while. Um, and then the last thing is, yeah, so because we kind of are a small eye bank with very little kind of, uh, with very little kind of wiggle room in the amount of uh, surgeries that we can miss and the amount of tissues that we can not take in, um, we, we definitely um, felt the impacts, I think, very greatly. This was before I was here. I was brought in kind of at the tail end, like I said, of the closure uh, for the pandemic, but definitely there were a couple months where the eye bank was just not in operation because there was too many, there were too many variables. Thank you. Yeah. So you talked to, so you mentioned, um, um, <clears throat> try about, you mentioned trying to figure out new uh, workspaces and things like that to accommodate, um, the ever expanding that you guys are doing it or that you have to be doing. Um, what types of, I guess, facility expansions are you guys requiring? Yeah, so I mean, we're not trying to expand necessarily. Like we're not trying to get more office space. It's more about um, optimizing what we already have. So right now, the floor plan of the, uh, of the suite that we're in is basically divided 50-50 between uh, lab and office, uh, just like for administrative side and then for technical side on the other on the other half. Um, and we're probably going to keep it like that, but we might like change around the way the lab is 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 fitted. Um, so basically making a room that is mostly storage maybe into more of an active processing room, stuff like that. Um, so mostly it's basically it's about it's about making the most of what we have rather than kind of uh, expanding in the traditional sense. But it's it's yeah, it's about making the floor space that we have kind of more, you know, um, valuable per, per square foot. And that's basically, like I said, um, getting new, new, better hardware for the iBank. So things like more uh, advanced microscopes and, and getting more kind of, yeah, more spaces where we can do, as you can imagine, all the work that we do in the lab has to be done um, aseptically. So things like flow hoods, where there's like a controlled airflow that keeps the tissue um, from being exposed to kind of ambient air that could be carrying any kind of contaminant. Um, so it's installing things like that um, basically is what I mean by increasing the amount of workspaces we have, because you can't just basically use any kind of countertop for the kind of procedures that I'm talking about. Okay, yeah, see, that's, that's, I think that's kind of the, the question I was getting at was like sure. um, hoods and things like that. Mm -hmm. But so if you guys had additional, whether it be, I don't know to call them interns or volunteers or whatever, mm -hmm, yeah. from the professions, um, would you guys be able to, to do things like vision screenings and things like that also, or? Yeah, I mean, that is kind of up to the lines. I mean, it's not something that is kind of in the scope of a normal eye bank, I would say, um, to have kind of an in, inpatient area. Um, it's it's doable, I think, in, what, in, in terms of the area that we have, but it might be like a little, a little, a little tight. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm up for anything that kind of, you know, increases the uh, footprint that we can have on the community. But um, I, I don't know. I, I'm up for it. <laughs> but it's, it's not typical. Um, normally, you know, the, obviously the lab area is very, very um, set away from kind of the area that it, even the administrative staff is in, because there's a lot of rules about access and things like that. Um, but I don't, I don't see why we wouldn't be able to use some of the administrative space that we have for something like that. And do you partner with other eye agencies? And yeah, when you talked about people donating the corneas, for example, all that administrative stuff, does that go through some other organization or do you do all of this? Yeah, so we work really closely with uh, Legacy of Life Hawaii, who is the, uh, we call it an organ procurement organization. So they handle uh, basically all of the other donations that, um, that happen after um, a registered donor passes away. So they are um, the, the organ recovery uh, organization for the islands um, and they work right across the hall from us. Um, so we have a really, really close uh, working partnership with them. And yeah, they handle a lot of the overhead in terms of uh, getting consents from uh, decedents next of kins and things like that. Um, so they're, they're a really, really useful partner. Um, we also work really closely with San Diego iBank, 
uh, because they're the kind of the closest mainland iBank to us. And so we work in terms of distribution, we work really closely with them um, because if we need to find a home for our corneas here, or if we need to source corneas from the mainland, if we've had a slow recovery week and we have surgeries coming up, um, they're usually really good about um, preferential distribution to us and, and vice versa. Um, but Legacy especially is, is a really close partner because like I said, we work physically very close to each other and the work that we do often overlaps. Um, so if somebody's uh, going to be you know, a lung or a skin graft donor, um, then they'll pass the case along to us and say, hey, this person has been consented by the um, by our uh, family services staff. Uh, and we think that this case would always be suitable for eyes. Um, and so then we'll take it as well and we'll work on it cooperatively. So, but primarily you are the lab portion of uh, the yes. process. Yeah, we, we have you. a totally independent lab um, that just does uh, cornea screenings, yeah. Okay, and do you do any kind of PR to promote the, the iBank? And if somebody wanted to make a donation, whom do they donate it to? Sure. Um, so most of the promotion happens kind of, again, through the Hawaii Lions Foundation. Um, we are kind of the, the, the main thing that they are concerned with, and they kind of do a lot of the outreach um, on behalf of the iBank. Um, but definitely, yeah, our, our website accepts donations. Again, lavh.org um, for anybody interested. Um, and yeah, I would say that we're very much considering, like, you know, increasing our presence uh, in, in terms of, yeah, outreach and things like that. We also, we partner with Legacy to do a lot of um, things like, you know, donor remembrance um, ceremonies, which are obviously really, really important um, to us. So they, they take the lead on a lot of the, um, a lot of the, a lot of the public education fronts too. Um, but also, yeah, the Lions are just generally like great about being able to get the word out about what the work is going, that's going on at the iBank. So I guess kind of blunt question, um, sure. do, do all doctors, like specifically um, GPs or um, hospitals know that the iBank exists? Like, That's like, a great question, yeah. Like what, I, what I mean by that is, mm -hmm. I mean, for you to get the corneas, obviously you have to have people to, um, cadavers to take them off of, right? But, you mm -hmm. know, is, is, are there areas or say, is there a possibility that doctors or facilities don't know that that the corneas can go to you guys? So there is, uh, there is in every state, uh, what is called a Uniform Anatomical Gift Act, which basically says that when a person passes away at a medical center, the medical center has to notify an organization that handles organ donation. Um, so basically that work's already done for us. It is, it is within the normal operating procedure of all of the hospitals in the country, essentially, to notify an organization that handles, you know, organ donation once a, a person passes away, whether or not they're registered in case the next of kin decides that they would want to make that decision. Um, and normally that happens through, like I said, legacy of life. Um, they're kind of the point of contact, but because we work so closely with them, they pass along the cases to us when they think that they're suited for eye donation. Um, so thankfully, yeah, there's not a big worry that we're missing out on cases because doctors don't know about us because the kind of, you know, staff that handles all of the proceedings that have to follow a person passing away, they know about us for sure. Yeah. Would it help any for the legacy of life when they have these ceremonies with the families to, um, and I mean, has this happened before where lions might attend? I mean, yeah, I'm sure they'd be welcome to. Um, yeah, I, I, I've only, I've only been to virtual ones, um, again, because I've only been here since, you know, things have kind of changed fairly radically. Um, but yeah, definitely, I, I think they're generally really uh, welcoming about it. Um, and I think that'd be Totally, totally fine by them and certainly fine by the iBank. I think that's all my questions. He did pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, like I said, I love to talk about the iBank. I, I really like the work that we're doing. Is there anything else you think we haven't covered that you want, want to communicate to anybody who's listening today about 
you know, whether they're in the public or considering organ donation or if they're yeah. with the Lions organization. Yeah, um, again, bottom line uh, is consider organ donation if you haven't already. It's a really, I understand that it's a sensitive and sometimes scary topic for a lot of people, but it's such an important conversation to have with your loved ones. Um, and it, it really does make a difference. Um, you know, if I can put anybody's mind at ease, we really do uh, treasure the gift to donate and really do handle um, the recovery procedure with the utmost professionalism, the utmost uh, sensitivity to the to the donor and to their families. Um, and you're you're doing a really really um, important important thing. Um, and if you want to, you can go to donatelifehawaii.org, I believe, to to register yourself if you haven't already. And I'm sure a lot of people would say, "Oh, I have really bad eyes." Or you mentioned glaucoma yeah. as one example, but can you just tell us briefly, you know, are people are more unwilling to donate mm -hmm. because they think, oh, they won't take my eyes? Yeah, yeah. Um, there are so many misunderstandings about, you know, what we look for. Uh, I definitely think that, you know, sign yourself up. And if you are ruled out, then we'll rule, your, rule you out. You don't need to rule yourself out, you know? Like, definitely, um, there are ways that, you know, your gift can be can be used in, in ways that you may not even have considered. Um, and definitely like we would rather you, you sign up than not um, because you, know, you may help somebody and not even realize that you could. All right, so if there are no further questions, um, Brent, thanks for, thanks for joining us, being with he us here today. Um, Certainly look forward to helping you get the word out a little bit more about the iBank. Um, Thank you so much. And, and hopefully this forum um, gives a little bit of a, a little bit more exposure to you guys and what you do. Yeah, thank you so much. It was really, really great to talk to you all. Um, yeah, thank you for all your yeah. questions. I really appreciated it. Sure. So everybody sitting at home in YouTube land, as I forgot to mention earlier in this in my, my caffeine high, um, be sure to hit the like and subscribe button for more updates and to help us with our YouTube algorithm. And uh, Brent, if anybody wants to get in touch with you or the or the iBank, um, how do they get in touch with you? I would encourage you to visit our website. Like I said, labh.org. Um, there are resources for people who are considering eye donation. There are resources for people who are potentially receiving corneal transplants. Um, and there's also uh, the address and phone number of the iBank itself if you're interested in stopping by or calling. Everybody in YouTube land, thanks for tuning in. Everybody um, on this call, thanks for being here with us.